My name is Halim Sa. I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at the Stone. We're in the third week of our four-week series on the sovereignty of God over suffering and evil. We've been going through the last chapters of Genesis and studying the life of Joseph. And what we've seen so far is that even though Joseph is the victim of the evil of his brothers, right, being sold off into slavery, and even though Joseph is suffering greatly, that God was sovereign. That as sin and suffering was unfolding, that our God was not sleeping. He was not a passive bystander. He was not a God who meant well, but was powerless to actually do anything when bad things happen. Our God is a sovereign God. And all things exist and all things happen for his glory and our good. And last week, Tyler taught us that this sovereign God is not merely a God who is far off in the heavens, in the distance, orchestrating everything, but that the sovereign God is a God who is near. And he's in the midst of us, in the midst of our suffering and pain. And he will never leave us or forsake us. And today, we're going to look at further the purpose of sin and suffering. The purpose of sin and suffering in our lives. We're going to be in Genesis 38 today. Genesis 37 is the chapter where Joseph is sold off into slavery, right, to Egypt. And Genesis 39 is the continuation of Joseph's story as we find him in his master Potiphar's house. In between these two chapters, Genesis 37 and 39, we have Genesis 38. And it's a chapter that causes us to blush a little bit. It's a chapter that um, may be unfamiliar to us because we probably skipped over it in Sunday school. It's one of those chapters that we read and we're like, oof. Can't believe that's in the Bible, right? Have you ever read chapters in the Bible like that? Well, Genesis 38 is one of them. It's like, uh, have you ever heard the story of the old country pastor in East Texas? And he says, church, we're family here. And God calls us to confess our sins to one another. And so we're going to have a confession night. And a lady gets up and she says, pastor, I told a lie this week. And the pastor says, tell it all, sister, tell it all. <laughs> And then a man gets up and he says, Pastor, I cheated on my wife. And the pastor says, tell it all, brother, tell it all. And then an old man in the back, old farmer wrinkled up in his overalls, you know, looking like he's already had a few Budweiser's, gets up and he says, Pastor, I listen to Justin Bieber. The pastor says, brother, I don't know that I would have told that one. <laughs> Genesis 38 is kind of like that, <laughs> not, not really, <laughs> but kind of. <laughs> it's one of those chapters that you read and you're like, God, I don't know if I would have told that one. Well, what happens in Genesis 38? In between Genesis 37 and 39, which tells the story of Joseph, we have Genesis 38, which tells the story of Judah and his family. If you remember, Judah is the brother whose idea it was to sell Joseph off into slavery. Well, what happens is that Judah marries a Canaanite woman and has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. He finds a wife for his son, Ur, his oldest, and her name is Tamar. The two of them don't live happily ever after, though. Verse 7 says that Ur was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and God kills him. And then what we see enacted is God's sovereign provision for a widow in the Israelite culture, which may sound strange to us, but here's how it goes. The brother of the deceased husband marries the widow so that she's able to have children and the name of the deceased husband not be blotted out. It's called a leveret marriage. Judah enacts the practice of leveret marriage and provides Tamar with his second son, Onan. But verse 9 tells us that Onan is not on board with this and through a creative method that you can read for yourself, refuses to get her pregnant. And then verse 10 tells us what, that what Onan did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so God kills Onan also. Maybe now you see why this story got skipped in Sunday school. <laughs> this is about to get worse. 
It's been a tough time for Judah. He's lost two sons and he's got one son left, Sheila, right? And he's still got Tamar to deal with and he knows that he's supposed to send Sheila to Tamar, but through Judah's eyes, Tamar, whoever marries Tamar seems to die, right? So he tells Tamar to stay in his house as a widow and that he will give Sheila to her when he comes of age. But even after Sheila is grown, he just can't do it, right? He's too afraid that Sheila too will die, that he may lose his last son. Verse 14 tells us that Tamar saw what Judah was doing and decides to take the matter into her own hands. After enduring the death of her husband, being rejected by her brother-in-law, and now with Judah withholding Sheila, she just can't take it anymore. It was the only thing she could think to do. And this time in culture, she couldn't just leave and find another husband. She couldn't just go get a job and live on her own. For a woman living in this time and culture, being married and bearing child meant everything. None of this is an excuse for what she's about to do, but bearing a child and continuing the lifeline was all her hopes and dreams. She hears that Judah was going on a trip to Timnah to shear his sheep and Tamar takes off her widow's garb for the first time in years and she dresses a little differently. She hides her face with a veil and disguises herself in clothes traditionally worn by prostitutes and positions herself strategically on the road to Timnah. And as her plan unfolds, Judah finds her, he finds her to be attractive, he wants her and thinks she's a stranger and sleeps with her and unbeknownst to him, she becomes pregnant. Three months go by and suddenly Judah hears the news that his daughter-in-law is pregnant, right? And she must be immoral, right? Because he has withheld Sheila from her. And so he commands that she be burned to death. Then in the final twist of irony, he finds out what the rest of us already know, that he's the man by which she's pregnant. God brings Judah to the point where he suddenly realizes what he's done and comes to repent. And he doesn't punish Tamar because it was his fault. He rightly says that all of this is a consequence of his own neglect of Tamar. And Judah in verse 26 says that Tamar is more righteous than he. And then Tamar has twins. That's Genesis 38. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Genesis 38. God killing people off because they're wicked. God's actions making a woman into a widow. And that widow being rejected and ab abandoned combined with the man who ends up sleeping with his daughter-in-law in his defense because he thought she was a prostitute. <laughs> so much sinning, so much suffering. It's like, oof. It's like the old country farmer. My God, I want to told this one. But he did. Why? Why is this chapter in here? We could easily not have it in here. It's so dirty and it's so shameful. If we took Genesis 38 and just snipped it out, right? Snipped it out. No one would know the difference. Nobody would bat an eye. Let me show you. If the last verse of Genesis 37 flows straight into the first verse of Chapter 39, this is what it would look like. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him, Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Last verse, chapter 37. First verse, chapter 39. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. You guys see that? We wouldn't have... If we would have went straight from Joseph being sold into slavery and straight into Joseph's story in Potiphar's house, it would have been a nice, clean flow. But God put Genesis 38 in there, didn't he? And guess what? We all have chapters like this in our lives. We do. Uh, chapters in our lives that's so dark, it's painful, and it's shameful. And it's tragic. And if it were up to us, we'd snip it out and we'd amputate it from our lives. We, there's things that we've all done. There's things that have been done to us. 
There's things that we've experienced that are our deepest, darkest. And if it was up to us, if you had the power, you would just cut it out, right? But you don't. You don't have the power. And it happened. Genesis 38 happened. It happened. Could God have prevented Genesis 38 from happening? Could God have stopped your Genesis 38 from happening? Yes, he's God, but he didn't. He didn't. He's God. He didn't. He didn't stop it. And we know that in all things that God does, he has a purpose. He has a good purpose. And so what's the purpose of the Genesis 38 in the Bible? And what's the purpose of the Genesis 38 in our lives? I wanna to offer to you at least two biblical purposes of Genesis 38 that we can cling to and find comfort and a peace in. The first purpose is this, that God ordains sin and suffering in our lives for the purpose of displaying the depths of his grace. God ordains sin and suffering in our lives for the purpose of displaying the depths of his grace. One reason why Genesis 38 is in the Bible is so that we could see it in contrast to Genesis 39. Immediately following the complete and utter failure of Judah, right, in sleeping with his daughter-in-law, in the very next chapter, we see the complete and utter success of Joseph in resisting the temptation to sleep with Potiphar's wife. These two chapters are right next to each other so that we could directly and explicitly see the difference between Judah the disobedient and Joseph the obedient. And if these two men are standing in front of you and God put you in charge of picking a team that would be the direct means of ushering in the salvation of men, who would you pick? Who would you pick? If Judah and Joseph are standing in front of you and God puts you in charge of picking a team that would continue the lineage through which the promised Messiah would come, who would you pick? We would pick the one with the better resume, right? The one who has a track record of displaying faithfulness and obedience, right? We would never pick the one who has sold his brother off into slavery, who gyps his daughter-in-law, who sleeps with the prostitute. We would never pick Judah. But here's the thing about God. He's always picking the wrong guy. He's always picking the wrong guy. We would pick Judah, but God picks Sorry. <laughs> See, the human mind, I just, I just want to pick, I just want to pick Joseph. We would pick Joseph, but God picks Judah, All right? Why? Joseph may get to play a leading role in Genesis, but Judah is going to play a leading role in the Bible. Because when we get to the opening chapter of the New Testament, the first chapter of Matthew, in the genealogy of our great Savior, here's what we see, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez. You guys see that? When Matthew recounts the fathers of Jesus' lineage, it is Judah, not Joseph, whose name joins Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus comes from the line of Judah, but more than that, Jesus comes from the sin and suffering of Genesis 38. Jesus comes directly from the horrific sins and suffering of Judah and Tamar. Names of women are not typically mentioned in ancient genealogies unless it's trying to make a point, and God is making a point in Matthew chapter 1. Let's read again. Starting in verse two, Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. 
and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. What names do you see? Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, God is making a point that he doesn't want us to miss. God could have even just put Judah's name, right? But he doesn't. He doesn't want us to miss it. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Not Judah's wife, but Judah's daughter-in-law. He doesn't want us to miss the purpose of Genesis 38. In Genesis 3, God made a promise. He made a promise. He said that the Messiah was coming. He said that the cross was coming. He said that his son, Jesus Christ, would come to be the ransom of men. He made a promise. He called a shot. He said he would make it happen. And how did he make it happen? He made it happen through sin and suffering. He made it happen through Judah and Tamar, a man sleeping with his daughter-in-law. He made it happen through Rahab, a common prostitute. Through Ruth, a Moabitess, a Gentile. She wasn't even Jewish to show us that the Messiah is for people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. He did it through David and Bathsheba, a woman taken from from adultery and murder. And if you look at the rest of the names in the lineage, it's not like they're any better. If you look at all the names that make up the lineage of the Jesus, they are filled with the second son, not the first, the younger, not the older, the barren, not the fruitful, the weak, the insignificant, the marginalized, not the strong, not the significant. It's made up of the deceiver, the adulterer, the prostitute, why? so that we would see the depths of God's grace. If this list is made up of only good people that did good things, we would not know God's grace. We wouldn't. What would it say to us about the beauty of the gospel and the grace of the cross if the lineage of Jesus were made up of perfectly pristine people, of perfect obedience and righteousness? It would say that Jesus came to save the righteous not sinners. It would say that the only hope of being accepted and loved by God is if we perfectly obey. And therefore, we would have the most enslaving and most hopeless gospel we could ever imagine. But as it is, in the way that God has sovereignly orchestrated the lineage of Jesus, the gospel says, for such a people as this, the Messiah came. For such a people as us, the rebellious, the stubborn, the disobedient, God is demonstrating and displaying the depths the depths of God's grace, and the Messiah has come. So what we see is that God brings about and endures the sin and suffering of Genesis 38 in the Bible and Genesis 38 in our lives for the purpose of most fully displaying the depths of his grace. Another purpose of Genesis 38 is that it produces worship. It displays grace and it produces worship. In Genesis 38, there's a lot of sin going on, right? But there's a lot of suffering also. The death of sons, the death of husbands, being abandoned and lied to. But what we see in God's word is that through God's sovereignty, the source of our greatest suffering can, be, can become the source of our greatest worship. What we see in the scripture is that through suffering, the source of our greatest suffering can become the source of our greatest worship. I don't know if you've ever heard of Joni Erickson Tata, but she's a person who has gone through a lot of suffering and pain. She's a person who devoted her life to serving people with disabilities and pointing them to Jesus as she speaks and writes about the purpose of suffering. 1967, when she was just 17 years old, she had a diving accident that left her quadriplegic in a wheelchair she writes the book, Suffering and the Sovereignty of God. She says, Romans 8.18 says that we can consider our present sufferings not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I have shared this before, but I must say it again, for I sure hope I can bring this wheelchair to heaven. 
Now I know that's not theologically correct, but I hope to bring it and put it in a little corner of heaven. And then in my new perfect glorified body, standing on grateful glorified legs, I'll stand next to my savior, holding his nail pierced hands. I'll say, thank you, Jesus. And he will know that I mean it because he knows me. He'll recognize me from the fellowship we're now sharing in his sufferings. And I will say, Jesus, do you see that wheelchair? You were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble because that thing was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. It never would have happened had you not given me the bruising of the blessing of that wheelchair. What is Joni saying? She's saying that God is in charge of suffering, that God put her in that wheelchair, but instead of bitterness and anger, what did it ultimately produce? It produced worship. She says, but the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you, and the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. It never would have happened. What? What would have never happened? Knowing and experiencing God to be more. Knowing and experiencing God to be more. It never would have happened had you not given me the bruising of the blessing of that wheelchair. For those of you who have gone through much suffering, my hope is that one day you'll find yourself in the worship of discovering God to be more than you ever thought or imagined and that you'll be able to say, God, I would have never known the pleasure of knowing you and worshiping you like this had you not given me the bruising of the blessing of my suffering. Romans 5, 3, 5 says it like this. Not only that, but we rejoice. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 5 tells us that we're able to rejoice even, rejoice in our sufferings because God gave suffering a purpose, because God gave suffering a job to do. God gave suffering the purpose of producing in us endurance, character, and hope. Think about it. You know, Jesus is our only hope in this world, right? He's our only hope in this world to be able to make it, to be able to persevere and make it till glory, right? But when life is comfortable, do we seek Jesus? No. When do we seek Jesus? When life is hard, right? When you wake up in the morning to a bright and sunny day with highs in the 70s, and your family is healthy, and you just got a raise, and you just lost 10 pounds, <laughs> are you thinking, oh Jesus, I need you today? Or not. I don't think anybody would, right? And so, what does God do? Because comfort and ease has a tendency to lull us to believe that everything's okay and that this is our home, right? But not everything's okay and this is not our home. God gives us the grace of suffering in our lives so that we'll wake up to the reality that we are in desperate need of Jesus every moment, every day. So that suffering will drive us to the feet of Jesus so that we'll worship him and not our comforts in this world. So we've looked at two out of the 10,000 ways in which God is purposing sin and suffering in our lives. Through sin and suffering, God displays the depths of his grace and he produces worship in us. And in closing, I want to address one common challenge, one common objection that you may have after hearing about God's sovereignty over sin and suffering. You may be thinking, okay, if God is in charge of everything, including sin and suffering, and ultimately he'll use it for my good, his glory, right? 
He'll use it to show us his grace and ultimately cause us to worship, right? Then why should I even fight my sin? Why should I waste my energy in trying to change me or anything in this world if God is sovereign? And he's going to do what he's going to do, and nobody can stop him. In fact, why don't I just send some more so that grace may increase? Does that sound familiar? Sounds like Romans 6.1. After Paul explains in Romans 5 how God ordained the fall of man to ultimately show the depths of his grace in offering eternal life through Jesus Christ, Paul preempts the next natural thought that people may have with this following verses. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Let me share with you one of my Genesis 38s. One of my dark chapters that God used so that I would experience the depths of his grace and and God ultimately used to produce worship in me, but he did it in a way that protected me from fatalism, that protected me from the thought, well, why does anything matter then? That protected me from being, becoming hopeless in my fight against sin. Several years ago, I went through a dark season. Um, my mom had passed away from cancer and I was seeking comfort and distraction in the wrong places. I started losing my desire to read God's word. I started becoming lax in my fight for purity in my life. I started becoming lax in the kind of TV shows I would let myself watch, the kinds of movies I would let myself watch, the kinds of images that I would let myself look at on the computer. I knew that it was not honoring God. I knew that I was sinning against him. I knew I was not honoring my wife, Angela, and sinning against her. And I was deeply ashamed. Didn't want to tell anybody. Didn't want to tell anybody. I wanted to just fix my behavior, right? But as only God can do, he was faithful, and one day he just overwhelmed me with conviction. I had to tell it all. You know? And so I got my elders together and confessed to them, and I sat down Angela and confessed to her, and confessing to my wife Angela was one of the hardest things I've ever done. You know, Setting her down in the living room and, and with the deepest of shame, telling her all the ways that I failed her. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she said, Halim, thank you for telling me. I forgive you. I love you, and I respect you. And then she said that, I know you'll fall again, but I'll forgive you again, and I'll still love you, and I'll still respect you. Through my sin, God allowed me to experience the depths of his grace through my wife, Angela, and through her words. Through my sin, he strengthened my relationship with Jesus and he strengthened my relationship with my wife to be stronger than ever before, right? So what does that produce in me? Because God ultimately purposed my sin for my good, should I keep on sinning? Should I start looking at pornography now so that my relationship with Jesus would be even stronger, so that my marriage would be, become even stronger? Shall I go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Because of the way that God sovereignly purposed my sin, I hate my sin more than ever. Because of the way that God sovereignly purposed my sin, I want to fight my sin more than ever. Because of the way that God sovereignly purposed my sin, I want to protect my marriage more than ever. Because of the way that God sovereignly purposed my sin, I want to worship God more than ever. More than ever. That's how he does it. That's how he's in charge. Questions may still remain, right? And this answer, this sermon or the next sermon may not answer them all. But let me ask you this. When you open up the scriptures, when you go to God's word 
and you say, God, show me who you are, do you get the sense that he's all powerful? Do you get the sense that he is in control? Do you get the sense that nothing happens in this world without a purpose? Do you get the sense that he loves you, that he's crazy about you, that he will move heaven and earth to save you, and because of his tender and fierce love towards you, that he would not let a single thing happen to you if it were not ultimately for your good and his glory? If you sense these things, it's because it's true. It's true. It's preciously true. But what makes this precious truth possible is this difficult truth of the sovereignty of God over suffering and evil. What undergirds this truth is this difficult truth of the sovereignty of God over sin and suffering. And my hope for you and my prayer for you is that you will not only come to the place where you believe in this difficult doctrine, but that you love it and that, it, and that you cherish it and it becomes precious to you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your sovereignty that is with us. We thank you that you purpose all things to serve us and point us to you. Even the dark things in this world, you've given them jobs and purposes, and it is not meant for evil, it is meant for good, and therefore you are good. And so we pray that you would work this difficult truth in our lives in such a way, Lord, that we'll be able to embrace it and cherish it, and that we will one day find ourselves in the worship of knowing you to be greater, better, more beautiful, more powerful, more sovereign than we ever thought or imagined. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.